For 66 years, the Simsbury mine produced high-grade copper, but it played out in time. In 1773, it became the second crown jail with that old Newgate name. I'm Tammy Zawistowski. I represent the towns of East Cranby, Suffield, and a portion of Windsor. One of the most frequent questions I get from constituents is, what's going on with old Newgate Prison? It's been closed since about the end of 2009, and the way it's situated on Newgate Road, it's very difficult to understand what's going on inside. It's got walls on, on all the sides, so if there's anything going on, the public can't see it. Um, just to get more information out available, I uh, decided to request a tour uh, of, the, of the facilities on um, about two weeks or so ago. Um, we had state officials, we had town historians, and other local people who were interested in what's going on. As a result of that, I thought it would be important to provide an update that the, the public could find out a little bit more about any, any of the reconstruction that's going on. And I've invited two people from the tour to, to sit down with me today and to talk about it a little bit about the importance of Newgate and also what the status is of the, of the uh, um, rec reconstruction. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Walter Woodward. He's a state historian and a professor at the University of Connecticut, and Daniel Forrest, the state historic preservation officer. Um, Walter, if you wouldn't mind just providing a little bit of information on, on what the historic importance is of old Newgate Prison. Sure. If you talk to people connected with Connecticut history, I think you'd find a general consensus among most people that of all the historic sites in the state, Newgate is one of the most important. And from a historic attraction standpoint, it's the one that offers absolutely the most potential. The, the, it's the site of America's first, or one of America's first prisons, depending on who you're talking to. But it, it certainly represents an important moment, both in the history of prison reform and in the history of America. It started out as a copper mine in the early 1700s, and the copper mine n never did all that well. It was closed in the 1750s, but in the early 1770s, as Connecticut, which was one of the, in fact, it was the only colony to have a patriot government in place before the revolution broke out. So as Connecticut's leaders, you know, looked in 1771, two and three at ever worsening conditions with the mother country, I think they were thinking it might be a nice place to house more prisoners if we ever needed to, looking ahead possibly to war. So in 1773, they did a tour of the site. Someone said, we've got some old copper mines, they'd make a great prison for people you don't like. So they went and toured the mine and they decided, yeah, these caverns that are 40 and 75 feet underground would in fact make a place that people couldn't possibly escape from, they thought. So in 1773, they did some remodeling below. They bought the site, and on December 22nd, three days before Christmas, John Hinson became the first inmate of Newgate Prison. He was sentenced for burglary to a 10-year sentence, and 18 days later, he escaped. So. So Hinson, is, uh, Hinson was one of many people who escaped from the mines. I think uh, one of the things those early colonial fathers forgot is that when they put mine shafts down, they often put more than one <laughs> shaft down. So some of these guys found great ways to get out. The, the importance of Newgate, when you read about the conditions, you think, God, this must have been awful. But compared to what people who committed crimes uh, received this punishment before Newgate, it was a great advance. It was actually a humane step forward in, uh, in the prosecution and punishment for crime. If you had committed a serious crime in Connecticut or anywhere, frankly, in the Americas or Europe prior to the 1770s, in this country, you would have been not separated from society, as prisons did, but you would have been severely uh, punished physically, and then you would have been marked physically so that everyone in society knew what your crime was. 
people who were counterfeiters were branded with a C. Uh, the Nathaniel Hawthorne story mm. of the Scarlet Letter, right? The woman who's condemned to wear the A. That was, that was punishment. People were shamed for their whole life for one crime. Sometimes they had their ears cropped, where they literally would cut slices out of their ears the way they did with cattle to mark them as, uh, as people who were unfit. So Newgate was, for, for all of the fact that they were dropping people down into a dark, cold mine, it was an improvement in punishment. The idea was put people away from society, let them work to, to uh, pay for their upkeep, and let them learn how to reform themselves while they're away from society and then release them back into society. So Yeah, Walter, some, some people think that the prisoners actually did mining there, and that's not the case, was it? Well, I think initially they tried mining, but they realized pretty fast that you've got people who are criminals down there with very sharp instruments, and it may not be the best approach. And a way so, to dig out. Mm -hmm. Right, absolutely. So, so what they did very early on is they said, we're going to come up with work for these people to do. And over the years, Newgate was a prison for, I think, 53 or 54 years. So there was a half century of operation. And over the years, they developed a wide range of employments for prisoners. Uh, for some of the most unskilled, they made nails. They'd give a prisoner 54 pounds of iron a week, and at the end of the week, they had to turn them into nails. Other people made barrels. Uh, they were barrels for whiskey. Uh, Connecticut already had a, a large distilling business, and they would make barrels, and they would put the prisoners, the person who'd made the barrel, they would burn the name of the person or the initials on it, and then they would take it and sell it to somebody, and they'd roll it down a 30-foot hill, and it would bounce, and if it got to the bottom and held water, the prisoner was credited with having made the barrel. If it leaked, the prisoner didn't get the credit, and they had to start over again. They made, at one time, they made baskets. Uh, they also made shoes. And in the early 1800s, they came up with this novel way to power a, uh, I believe it was a, a mill wheel, where they built a human treadmill. Mm -hmm. And this was supposedly high-tech prison reform. They tried it in Europe, and Newgate was the first place in America to try it, I think, where they put up to 20 men inside a wheel, just like a hamster, and they'd have them walk, like climbing stairs all day, to run this grist mill. Mm. The things that we think are terrible, they really saw as being advanced and progressive. Mm. Go figure. Yeah. But, uh, no, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of interesting stories that that come out from from the from the mine from the prisoners. I mean, there there were several escapes and everything else, and it's interesting. Um, a lot part of part of uh, almost a, a rite of passage growing up in in Connecticut was to take a trip as a child to, to Old Newgate Prison and, and and wander around the mines and everything. Um, and the the people that were you know, the docents had these great stories, so we're hoping that once it gets open again, we'll be able to enjoy some of those stories as well. Well, you know, one of the things that's underway that Dan will talk about is the, the new lighting they've already put in there in preparation for the reopening. And it's a great kind of spooky, wonderful place to go. It, it, um, it, the site is, in some places it's Byron-esque, in some places it's scary, in other places it's, it's truly historic. It, this, this is just an amazing, an amazing place to think that people lived underground, and in fact, some of them liked it. I've got a description. Um, got a description by William Stewart, who actually wrote a book about his life as a counterfeiter, in which he has a couple chapters where he describes his five-year sentence at Newgate, uh, and he found a way to work the system pretty well, but. This is his description of the above-ground dormitories that they built in 1724. They built a four-story uh, four dormitory with 50 cells and with offices for the jailers. He said, the rooms were only lighted with a small, heavily graded window pane, overstocked with lice, fleas, and bed bugs, and the floor five inches deep of stinking filth. I exclaimed in the language of Milton, 
hail horrors, and thou in fertile hell receive thy new possessor. Pretty good command of English for a counterfeiter. He went on to say, and imagine this as progressive prison reform, armies of fleas, lice, and bedbugs nightly covered every inch of this polluted prison and would skip, hop, and crawl away to avoid being trampled in the mire upon the floors like the grasshoppers of a meadow in the month of August. So what do you think, Tammy? You yeah, I think I'd rather be down in the mine. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, is, this mm -hmm. actually was what made them finally decide in 1727, three years after they built this four-story building, that they would close Newgate. The prisoners, when they were above ground, they were under constant surveillance. So they realized that if they went down into the mines at night, said when the cover was over, nobody could hear what we did. And they'd save up wax and they'd take it down with them, they'd light the candles, they'd get out the fiddles, they'd smuggle in liquor, they danced, they partied, they did all sorts of things. A religious re prison, uh, 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 evangelistic prison reformer in the 1820s touring America visited Old Newgate, went underground and was appalled, not because of the conditions but because the possibilities of what those prisoners might do at night down there. And he, you know, he went around the state preaching against the sin that cannot be named. And that led to this moral uh, indignation. And they decided to close Newgate and open Weathersfield Prison shortly well, after that. On that note, since it was closed then, it's still closed now. Um, uh, Dan, if you would talk a little bit about um, what, what's going on at the prison today and when we can expect it to open back up to the public. We, ha we have a whole group of kids that's never been there. Sure. And, you know, thank you very much for the opportunity to come here to talk and about And thank the you for being here, making. yes. So uh, the State Historic Preservation at DECD has been working to uh, reopen Newgate since it closed in 2009. Um, we had a number of important systems upgrades that we needed to do. Uh, in particular, at, uh, in 2009, it became apparent that the electrical system and the existing lighting system that we had installed in the mines uh, was at the end of its use life. And that electrical and lighting system was never really actually designed to be in the constant moisture of the mine uh, itself. And so things had corroded and we had lots of uh, shorteds, uh, shorts excuse me, in the electrical system that became a safety issue. Uh, so we set forth to replace that and actually put in a new uh, lighting system that did a much better job of actually retaining the original character of the mine. Uh, so it's designed to be low-level lighting that provides for the safety but still retains as much of the original uh, character and feeling uh, for the visitors uh, who go down there. What came out uh, while we were working on the electrical system and getting the new lighting system installed is that the guardhouse at the um, prison which is the last surviving intact historic building uh, within the prison yard itself, uh, was once again in uh, structurally compromised condition. And so uh, really quickly, that guardhouse has uh, a history, uh, a, a checkered history. Uh, it originally was constructed as a timber uh, building. It burned at least three times uh, before it was constructed out of stone and brick in 1790. And then a piece of the building, uh, the western extent of it, was actually uh, constructed afterwards. And it's that addition uh, on there that is now uh, um, in very difficult condition. And what we've learned is, is that the building itself, that portion of the building, was constructed on very unstable uh, material removed from the mine when the copper was being extracted. So uh, in essence, there's a very uh, loose, thick deposit of rubble on a steeply sloped piece of bedrock uh, directly underneath the building. And so the building has been settling and sinking uh, since then. And since the building is made out of stone and brick, uh, it's not very flexible, and it has cracks uh, that have been forming. And I was very impressed with, um, you had mentioned that the um, crack monitors had been installed, that one of them actually broke because th it couldn't withstand the pressure. That's correct. And so if, um, and when the, when the, um, property opens up again, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to take a look at that um, after the building has been stabilized because there's uh, quite a bit of visible evidence that this problem has been going on since the building was originally constructed. So it was built on an unstable landform. Uh, it's been adapted over time to try to compensate as the building sinks. So even um, the building was trying to escape. Even the building <laughs> was trying to escape. Gravity was not its yeah. friend. So, yeah. Um, 
while uh, we were preparing, hoping to open after the new lighting system was installed, um, we had structural engineers come out after the staff recognized that the building uh, seemed to be moving again and assessed it and determined that the building was uh, unstable and that we needed, to, uh, we needed to stabilize it before we could safely open for the public. Yeah. Um, if you could just let us know where, where we stand now in that, in that process. Sure. So uh, we have now, uh, we have selected a, a preferred contractor to do the stabilization work um, for the property. And it's a, uh, it's a particularly difficult project um, to plan and execute um, because of the specific engineering constraints that we have uh, on the property and because of its uh, National Historic Landmark status. So this site is incredibly significant, as Walter has, has already discussed, um, for its rich history and for how tangible that history is for people who visit the property. Um, but another whole aspect of that is it's an incredibly rich archaeological site. Mm. And so when we're doing construction that disturbs the deposits there, we've got we've to take a look at those and make sure we're not losing an important part of the history for that. So uh, what we, what's occurred now is we've planned for the stabilization uh, um, for the project. And what that's going to entail is temporarily stabilizing the guardhouse uh, on a series of um, piers and beams. The whole superstructure will be supported temporarily while the entire foundation, uh, new foundation is poured and the original stonework is uh, reconstructed on top of that uh, in order to permanently attach the building to the underlying bedrock. So there'll be pilings installed that go all the way down to the bedrock below the building that will attach to the new foundation system. Uh, the state had previously tried to fix this situation uh, in right around the year 2000 and that, that repair, pouring additional concrete around it, uh, was unsuccessful. Uh, where we are now is our contractor has, uh, as of Monday, submitted all of the required certifications mm -hmm. for Good. their insurance coverage, which is one of the requirements that we have um, in order to uh, get them under contract and to uh, start the construction. Uh, that's under review, and then we just need to get our contract signed. Um, everybody is prepared to move as quickly as possible once that contract is signed in order to get the work started. Mm. So we're uh, very anxious. Our goal is to actually at least have a limited open opening this fall. Uh, we'd like to have a soft opening to invite the public back in to see the property, uh, see the progress that we've made, and uh, talk about the future of the museum and our, our plans to do more aggressive programming. That sounds good. It sounds like you're on track from what you described what, during the day of the tour. I'm glad to okay. see that the, uh, the paperwork is caught up with it. That's right. And so we're very happy to see this uh, actually uh, start. And nobody's going to be more excited uh, to see those machines rolling than the staff. Oh, who've absolutely. Been out there all along. Absolutely. Um, the, uh, what are the plans? Uh, people also ask about the Vietz Tavern, which is mm -hmm. across the street from there. Sure. Um, I, I, this is not part of this particular project, but what, what, what are the future plans for it? Sure. So uh, around 2007, uh, the state did a lot of structural repairs on the interior of Vietz Tavern, uh, things that are not immediately visible um, from the exterior. Uh, that was necessary because that building was uh, also deflecting and moving quite significantly. So uh, as soon as we get the work started on the stabilization for the, um, for the guardhouse within the prison yard, we're also going forward with the minor carpentry repairs and particularly the painting of Leeds Tavern um, right now. The condition is um, very poor um, from the exterior mm -hmm. and that's something that we need to address. Uh, the goal in the long term is to try to come out uh, with a plan with additional community input for how to do how to stitch Beats Tavern back into the old Newgate um, visitors experience in a much more comprehensive way. So we've got lots of ideas uh, that have been brought forward to us by members of the public and other parties who are involved. Uh, those range everywhere from reopening it as a tavern um, to using it as a, an, another interpretive center. Um, Vietz Tavern is an absolute gem of an 18th century oh, yes. building. It's a spectacular building, um, and we're, we're very much looking forward to, again, opening that property as and, well. And it's a lot bigger than it looks from the road, too. It's, a, it's been expanded repeatedly yeah. throughout the history, and it's so closely associated with uh, the prison operations and even the mining uh, at Old Newgate. It's a, it's a spectacular piece. We're very lucky to have it as part of the property. Yeah, I'm also very pleased that you're getting public input on it. We are, and in fact, yeah. I think when we're engaged in the planning for the long term for um, how to move forward with Old Newgate as a, as a public asset and as a, as a real asset to the community, um, we really want to get additional, provide opportunities for public meetings and take in additional input so that we make the best choices on those uh, yeah. decisions. This, this really could be a centerpiece of, of, 
of uh, a lot of area. If we have so many historic assets in, in our, the, our immediate area. Yeah. This could be really a centerpiece that could draw tourism to the area. It is, and I, you know, I can say just from my own personal experience, I remember very much, very clearly, the first time my parents brought me to that mm -hmm. property. I was small enough that I could walk through all of the mine shafts upright without stooping. Um, and it made an enormous impression on me. And I think a big part of the Newgate is experience is actually being in those mines mm -hmm. because it is so evocative. And as Walter has said, it's Byronesque in parts, the ruins there. It's a challenge in terms of administering <coughs> that and, and preserving it, but it is such a compelling user experience, uh, visitor experience, that we're very anxious to get it um, opened again. And you know, one of the, one of the strengths that Newgate has that is, as a state historian, I see many different places around the state, and there are, all over the state, there are people passionately committed to the preservation of their historic sites and their important local historical places. But there's a kind of critical mass at Newgate that you don't see in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. there, Newgate, it's as if the community understands just how important this mm -hmm. site is and people are still passionately committed to its preservation, which is, that's the greatest strength a place can have is people on the ground who will fight for it. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. There's been, there's been an incredible <laughs> amount of local interest and, you know, and, and from surrounding communities as well. Uh, is there any, any um, really interesting archaeological finds that that have, that have come across? You've come across during some of the initial exploration of the site. Sure, um, you know, and Walter cued this up actually quite well, um, perhaps not knowingly. Uh, we've done some recent excavations actually that are assisting in planning for the stabilization. Uh, Nick Bellantoni, the state archaeologist, and I. Uh, we're working inside the old uh, guardhouse to get a sense for what materials directly underneath the foundation. Part of those excavations, one <coughs> of the most interesting artifacts we found is a very small handmade die, a single dice, uh, that was very likely made by a prisoner. It's small enough that it was probably hidden away. And I think, for, as an archaeologist, one of the most intriguing things, and I think one of the most powerful things that archaeology can bring to the old Newgate story, is much more detailed information about what the prisoners were doing. Mm. Um, and we, all, we know that prisoners are always finding ways to either entertain themselves or keep themselves busy. The archaeology is the best opportunity to <coughs> sort of flesh out the, the historical record that we have and really paint a clearer picture about what people were experiencing there. Mm. So there, there are quite a few other artifacts. The other huge advantage from an archaeological perspective that Old Newgate has actually is directly related to the copper itself. Since the um, rock is so rich in copper, copper is a a very strong preservative, and so all the organic materials, hmm. wood, bone, uh, antler, the That's things great. that a lot, of, um, a lot of tools were made from in the 18th <coughs> and 19th centuries that would have rotted in Connecticut soils, um, are actually preserved where they're in contact with that copper. So we find things that are a bright blue-green color, but uh -huh. otherwise look remarkably like they were uh, when they were originally dropped. Hmm. The, uh, the, main, the main focus right now is, is on the guardhouse, but there are some <laughs> other standing ruins. That, is is there correct. any, any um, work that's going to be done on those to make sure that they're stable and they don't deteriorate sure. further? The, you know, the next biggest concern, so we have uh, the guardhouse stabilization, uh, the repairs for Veet's Tavern, um, especially the, the painting. Um, beyond that, we have to look towards the stabilization of uh, the ruins for the, gar uh, the block um, cells, the cell mm -hmm. block, excuse me, which is a large multi-story uh, open ruin right now. Um, it's quite remarkable those walls are still standing. They don't look like they should be. Yeah. So the, the, that building burned in 1904. Uh, the other buildings in the prison yard largely built in the 18, burnt in the uh, 1880s. And those freestanding walls without any floors or roof over them are always vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a challenge how we stabilize those uh, in a way that doesn't put them at risk uh, for collapsing while we're repairing them, but make sure that we retain the overall character of that. So we are considering uh, putting in a steel skeleton of some sort mm -hmm. that will physically support those walls and make sure they're standing, but also give the visitors an opportunity to see what that um, what that cell block actually looked like, to show a skeleton of the outline of the buildings with all oh, the window openings and yeah. platforms if we can manage it so that uh, people can actually get up there and see uh, the views that were available. If nothing else, at least get them cl close enough to not worry about things falling down on them. It really That's looks right. precarious. It, it certainly is precarious and um, the, as I said, that property is a particular challenge and the, the nature of, since there have not been roofs over those walls in a long time, uh, they do degrade, uh, usually slowly, but they get to a critical point at which they're at risk. Mm -hmm. so. but, um, Walter, any, any other comments that you might have about? 
what I, you know, I can't wait for the day that the site is back up and in full operation and I can go there with my family and we can go visit the site and climb around underground and then go across the street to Veet's Tavern for something. Maybe a beer, maybe a Coke, but it'll be great. Yeah, a lot of people are really looking forward to it. Yeah. They, um, so we're looking at, um, is it a poss possibility of a soft opening this fall? We're all crossing our fingers for That's that. That's our target. Yeah. Um, and even if there are special events, many people remember that we used to have very popular Halloween events. Yes, um, that's one of the first things dates. I hear from people. And I, I think that would be a, a fabulous opportunity for us to welcome the public back to the property. So that might be a possibility. Yes, we're, if, we're, we're certainly hopeful. Oh, that would be, that would be really great. The, the, the view, you know, prisoners may have had a tough life, but in October they had one of the best views in New England. Mm -hmm. It is a prison. It's unbelievably pretty. Oh, very much so. And uh, how many acres is, are there? It's 18 acres 18 on that side, yeah. and there's an additional 26 <laughs> acres surrounding uh, Veet's Tavern as well. Okay, so I mean, there's maybe some opportunities for other types of activities going on there at some point too, sure. when everything's up and running. Absolutely. And so uh, that would that would be really super. Yeah, I mean, we're all we're all looking forward to to with even soft opening, regular opening, uh, get the get the uh, tour tour buses back in. Yeah, it, it's a it's a fabulous attraction. In fact, it's it's by far our best attended of the four historic museums that the, uh, the agency operates. So um, it, it would be great to, to open the doors and see people start coming back. Yeah, uh, real, really, um, I just want to say thank you for, to both of you um, for the, taking the time to come in and, and, and chat about it. And it's really important for, for our public to understand what's going on. And I think you've both done a great job in not only mentioning what's going on and, and, and describing it more fully so, so that you know, people can kind of have some expectations now, but also to provide some additional input on, on what the history of the, of the uh, museum has been well, since it's been yeah. out of the public eye for a while. Yeah. But thank you very much, both of you, for, for coming in and spending some time. Thanks for 66 for years, the Simsbury mine produced high-grade copper, but it played out in time in 1773.